I'm just going to come back right to here, my apologies, to tell the owl story one more time so that we can get it on the recording. So the question here was about the a bird that a young boy, a 10 or 11 year old Ignatz van Patchley found, where he either tried to catch this bird, whether it was an owl or a hawk, I've seen both uh, options there, whether he tried to catch it and broke its wing or its leg in the process, or whether he came upon the bird um, and discovered it had a break and then captured it and took it home to nurse it. This young man was astute enough to notice that there was something wrong with the owl's eye and a dark line had formed and that the line had disappeared as the bird got better. Now, the questions here are, a young boy capturing a bird of prey? Hmm, question mark. A young boy being able to notice something in the eye of a bird and, uh, and attribute it to the leg or the wing? Hmm, questionable. So as I've discussed this with various people, this is what Bill Caradonna says. Now, Bill Caradonna was one of the original founders of what is now the International Iridology Practitioners Association. He's also my constitutional iridology instructor. He says, modern iridology can't explain the owl story. Von Petschley's story from a very long time ago has not been reproduced. So it is a waste of time to repeat it. It just creates confusion. Critical thinking is required when applied to any topic. And that is so important that we think critically, that we never take anything we're told, even things that I tell you at face value, that we always ask questions and dig deeper to uncover the truth. Bill Caradonna goes on to say this. If you look at a picture of an owl's eyes, or most any animal, the structure of the iris is different from humans. There is no anterior stroma, just a smooth posterior leaf without individual strands of fiber. So what does that mean? The human eye has stroma, which is layers of fiber stacked up to make the iris. When we see a radial furrow or a black line in a human eye, it's because there is a separation in the fiber and we're looking down through the depths of the stroma to the posterior leaf. But animals and particularly owls don't have all these layers of fiber on top. They only have the posterior leaf, which means there is no fiber to separate to look down into. So, this idea that this black line formed and then disappeared, as Bill says, is structurally impossible. Structurally impossible. So we need to be aware of things like this. And we need to ask these questions before we accept things at face value. So let's look at some of the other myths that are out there. And these are myths that I can give you human examples of. Now look at these two pictures. These are the same person taken with different cameras, 23 years apart. As you look at these two images, what differences do you see? What differences do you notice? I'd love it if you type that in, in the comments box if you're with me on Zoom, or in the Facebook comments if you're with me in Facebook, or in the comments if you're with me on Instagram Live. What differences do you see between these two images that are of the same person? I'm gonna give you just a minute to give me some answers here because there are some very clear differences. And this is these are important differences. And we wanna talk about why are they there. Chanel says the color is different. Absolutely, the color is different. Color is vastly different. The image on the left is sort of a steel blue gray. The image on the right is more of a violet blue. Absolutely. The obvious is color and the intensity of the yellow. Yeah, Rossum, very much. Lighter of yellow. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about why those changes are there. Because no one pointed out that this pigment, can you see the brown? right here is not present in the older image. 
Okay, so as we look at this, there are a couple of things that we need to know. We're gonna blow some myths out of the water. The first one is that um, the thing that has changed here is simply that the technology changed. Look at the skin tones. Look at the color of the sclera. That reflects a change in camera. Now the fact that this camera was an incandescent flash and the, with an, this was a print image and the fact that this is a 24 megapixel camera with an LED flash set to fluorescent lighting totally changes the colors we see, which means we cannot use the image on the left and the image on the right as color comparisons. We have to know what the technology was. The other thing that we've been taught way back when that has been disproved is that pigment does not disperse. The changes we see in the color here, this orange to the yellow, is again a technology change. Hi, Iridology Tim, good to see you. This is about technology change. It's about a difference in the quality of the light. It has nothing to do with cleansing. And what we do know is that pigment accumulates with time. It does not disperse. We do not cleanse pigment out of the body. So as we look at these, we have to remember that what changes can happen are accumulation of pigment. Sometimes the overall pigment of the iris will fade with time, but not as the result of cleansing or fasting or supplements. The other thing that changes very dynamically is the sclera. I want you to look at this sclera in the upper left corner of this image, and you can see this Harry Potter-like zigzag. Well, 23 years later, it is significantly heavier. So this is telling us about things that are activated in the body right now. This blood vessel, however, which was significantly heavier 23 years ago, is much lighter now and that tells us that whatever this is talking about has resolved. So that is where we see the dynamic change. It's in the sclera as far as response to things that we've done. Response to cleansing, response to supplements, that all can show up in the sclera, but the iris is not going to fade because we uh, pigment in the iris is not going to fade because we've done cleanses or we've taken herbs or we've done things like that. So, so important for us to recognize those changes. Then old myth, an old myth is that pigments equal toxins. And we were taught 40 years ago, you can cleanse those out. What we know now is again, that is not true. Harry Wolf who is, again, the second founder of what is now the International Iridology Practitioners Association said this about being able to cleanse pigment out of the eye. He says, in fact, it's bogus and a dogma only found among some old school holdouts from the Lindlar, Kritzer, and Jensen schools of thought. The notion that certain metals, minerals, toxins, routinely show up as diagnostic indicators in the iris has long been refuted and proven unreliable. There is likewise no evidence to support the notion that heavy metal toxicity is measurable in the iris or that it can be cleansed out of the eye. Pigments we see in the eyes are inherently determined. So the pigment in this eye that in this one image look more intense than here but again that is due to lighting not due to anything else this is all inherent this person was programmed genetically programmed to have these pigments so what do these pigments tell us 
pigments tell us two things very specifically. The first thing they tell us is that there is an organ or a system in the body that is programmed to be out of balance. That doesn't mean it is out of balance right now, but it is programmed to be out of balance. The second thing it teaches us is depending on where that pigment is sitting, it teaches us which organs <coughs> are likely to be suffering because of the fallout of that imbalance or likely to have an impact from the fallout of that imbalance. Okay, so as we look at this and we see that this in the original image is orange, <coughs> excuse me, that would suggest pancreas. And we know that pancreas can have an impact on just about every system in the body because of its ability to mess your blood sugars up and mess your carbohydrate assimilation up, right? Make sense? <coughs> Pardon me, I've got a bit of a tickle in my throat. grab a sip and try to take that away. Okay, so the other thing, this goes back to the owl story about black lines forming when there's a broken bone. <coughs> oh my goodness. And so these are my own eye photos. First one taken in 2017, you can see there's nothing in the arm reaction field. March 2019, I had a nasty, or nasty fall about a week prior to this where I broke two bones in my wrist, ended up having surgery, and have metal plates installed in my wrist now. Just after I got that cast off, literally about a week or two after I got the cast off, I slipped on some stairs and I broke my elbow and again needed surgery to put in some hardware to put it back together. There is, and that happened on Mother's Day, so I think that was May 12th. Not a black line in here to be seen. August 5th, again, what we see is there's no black line. Total Things are totally healed. The doctors, the physios, everything says really well healed. Rosam says, oh my goodness, yeah, right? It was a really rough spring. Never broken a bone in my life before. Never had surgery, and here I was in the course of 10 weeks, three broken bones, uh, three surgeries, two of them at one time because they had to go in through, let me just, they had to go in through here between the tendons and here on the side of my arm to put both the plates in for the first surgery. So it was a pretty intense summer, but do you see any black lines on there? I didn't. I'm surprised that I had the presence of mind to track the photos, which I did, which is really fun because it's a great study. You would think that after all of that trauma, the broken bones and the surgeries, that there would be something if, if it was going to change the eye structure. But here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. The breaks did not change my inherent genetic structure. If I was a young woman, as in, in my 20s and 30s, and just going to embark on having children, these breaks would not pass on to my children, correct? I would not pass on to them the genes that say broken wrist, broken elbow. And because this is not a genetically influenced thing, it's never going to show up in my eyes because the surgeries didn't change my genetic structure. It will not show up in the eyes. So the concept of black lines showing a break or a closed lacuna showing a break or healing lines forming, which again is an old Jensen throwback where they talk about when healing happens, you get little white lines that um, do this woven thing inside lacunae as things are healing. It doesn't happen. It does not happen. Not at all. And so as we look at this and you compare the white lines that are in here, they're not healing lines. They pre-existed the break by two full years. All of these white lines, they all pre-existed the break by two full years. So we know that healing lines do not happen. That is another one of the myths. And so, you know, as we look at this, it's really important again for us to ask these questions and even to do our own little studies. Another huge myth is I can see a parasite in your brain. Now you might have seen on Facebook people doing the free iris analyses and I always 
oh my goodness, those things drive me nuts. Because when people post their images and someone says, I'll do a free iris analysis for you, and they give this long list of all these marks they see, and then they give this long list of all the things it means, and this long list of all the things that you can do about those markings, it's like the most useless list I've ever seen. Because it take, does not take into account what that person is actually doing for their health right now, what situations they've actually got under control and they figured out really well. It also doesn't take into account the person who's doing the iris analysis is training. Okay. And so that is so important. You always have to ask that, what's your training? Where did you get your training? And then you need to vet that training. So important. And so Lila's saying, can I send you a picture of my eyes? Lila, I don't do little analyses on, in, on social media for this exact reason, because I need to have a conversation with you. We actually need to have a con, uh, a consultation. We can do that online, but the images that you're going to get with a cell phone are not going to be good enough to do a proper analysis with. I assure you, and I guarantee you, and I need an hour with you to ask you questions. I need to know who you are, how you are put together, what you're already doing for your health. And so I don't make my money doing an analysis online because I think that is really low integrity. When we look at an image like the one you see on your screen right now, and there are lots of people who would say these black lines mean you have parasites. No, they don't. They do not mean you have parasites at all. That again says, uh, Harry Wolf says that this is an American, North American iridology thing that is extremely unreliable and that it is just totally wrong along with the concept of you can do a cleanse and change your eye color. Okay, so these lines actually teach us more about the nervous system than they do about anything else. And when we combine these lines with these rings that come around here, it teaches us about this person's inherent predispositions as to how their nervous system wants to work. And it is, um, it is so important that we take all of that into account. And Lila's as asking, how do we book a session? Um, and so uh, I'm so glad you're understanding what I'm saying. And all you would need to do is uh, direct message me, just direct message me, and we can look at what we're gonna do and how that's going to work for you. So as we look at this, we don't see parasites in the brain. We absolutely do not. And if a person has parasites, stop and think for a moment. If a person has parasites, those parasites don't change the genetic structure of the person's body. If I have parasites, I am not going to be able to pass those parasites on to my children when I give birth to them, right? Because they're not in my genes. They might pick up parasites from the environment, but it doesn't change the genetic structure. So what we need to, to remember as well here is that, remember I talked about people doing that long list of all the different indicators and everything they mean and everything the person should do about it? As iridologists, we are not, unless we're licensed medical doctors, we are not legally permitted to diagnose or prescribe. Now, quite frankly, I don't wanna diagnose because what I've seen is too often if the wrong label is attached, if the wrong label is attached, the wrong treatment is given. I would rather look at the eye in the context of my client's symptoms and um, use the eye to understand why they have the symptoms they do and then use that understanding to help me craft a better nutrition program, select some appropriate supplements to take us to the ne next step of healing. But we do not get to diagnose or prescribe. Now, way back when I did Jensenian iridology, I spent all my time diagnosing. I did. And you know what? I was always wrong. Always wrong. It didn't work. Totally didn't work for me. But learning constitutional and learning how to use the eye to help me actually 
understand the body. So use the eye to help me understand what questions I need to ask my client to get to know them at a really deep level. That's where everything turned around. And it, it's so fabulous to not have to do these stupid long lists of things that mean nothing to my client, right? I'm not going to use fancy jargon with them because it's not going to you to work. Bell Caridona says iridology should not be used to diagnose. It is a unique assessment tool to gain understanding of the blueprint of the body, including tendencies towards illness patterns or the assessment of resiliency and the resistance against negative influences. But diagnosing the presence or the status of illness or disease is never appropriate for an iridologist. Never. And so over the last several years, I have been teaching constitutional iridology to wellness practitioners like you. And it has been so rewarding and it's so exciting. The next go round of com constant, uh, Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, which is what I call my course, is coming up in April. And I'd love to take just a moment to share with you just a few of the details of what's involved in this course. Now, registration isn't open. I'm not selling anything right now. Just saying, just giving you some information so you can maybe mark some dates on your calendar. So the next go round of Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is starting April 16th and April 17th. Now, let me just give you a little more information here. This is uh, taught by live webinars. So it's not broadcast over Instagram, but it's taught by, via Zoom. And, um, and with this, it is taught over 20 live two hour long classes. We keep it, uh, we, lots of support, lots of mentoring as well. So it's not just a 40 hour program. Um, the course is being scheduled for two cohorts, one that will be Thursday mornings, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, one that will be Friday afternoons from 4 till 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Now I'm offering those times to accommodate many time zones around the world. So if you register for the Thursday section, you would be 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. in London, England, or for those in Australia, crappy time, 3 a.m. But if you're in Australia, then this Friday class, Friday for me, works better. 3 p.m. <coughs> Sorry about that. 3 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern, so still works great for North America, 11 p.m. London, not so hot, 8 a.m. Saturday morning for Australia. Okay, so this is really important that we want to um, make this aware. Now, if you are, want to be aware of when the next registration is actually opening, and it'll be mid-March sometime, go on to iridology.education. You're going to see a little pop-up window there that gives you the opportunity to opt in for my iridology map. When you opt in for that, you'll be added to my email list. And that will let you know when classes like this, these free master classes are happening. It'll also let you know when registration is open. And um, Lila says the reason we don't get to diagnose and prescribe is because pharmaceutical companies don't want us to. And you know what? I even just walk away from that whole concept, Lila. The reason I don't diagnose or prescribe is because I don't want to. It doesn't serve a useful purpose. Putting a name on a disease process doesn't give me understanding of what's going on in the body. Taking the time to piece together all the client's symptoms and understand why they're there, that gives me understanding of the body. And I don't need to attach a diagnostic label to that. I don't need to attach a prescriptive protocol to that. I can simply work with the body. In the scope of Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, you will learn all of the information, you'll have all of the curriculum required by the International Iridology Practitioners Association to prepare you to certify with them if you so choose. And so again, registration will be opening mid-March and I would absolutely love 
to have you in that class with me. All right, so we've dispelled some myths here. We've talked about the eyes don't change because we cleanse or because we do a special diet or we take certain supplements. The white of the eye might clear up, might become brighter and clearer. And when that becomes brighter and clearer, it's going to make the iris look brighter and clearer. But if we do before and after pictures of the iris itself, we'll note that there is no change. We note, noted that we cannot cleanse pigment out of the eyes. We've noted that there's no such thing as healing lines. And we've also noted that parasite lines are bogus. Those lines that are in the eyes have nothing to do with parasites at all. And so we've dispelled some of the key myths and fables that are out there that just are hanging on. And I hope with that, that that's given you an extra layer of knowledge to work with. And I look forward to seeing you in the next masterclass on Friday at 11 Mountain Time. Have a fabulous week. I look forward to seeing you on Friday at 11. And thank you so much for being with me. Just noticing a comment here. Uh, Stephanie on Facebook says this, preach on. I was so crushed every time I'd seen iridologist years ago because she fussed on me for having parasites every time. Hmm. And Tracy asks, intestines are stronger now? Um, Tracy on Facebook, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but we can certainly continue that conversation uh, when we're not on the Facebook Live as well. So with that, my friends, thank you again for being with me. I really appreciate your time today, and I look forward to seeing you on Friday. Bye for now.